Good afternoon and welcome to uh, the joint CAD1 BD Mackey Consulting uh, presentation this afternoon on Navisworks search sets. My name is Stan Henney. I'm the business development manager here at CAD1 and I have Mr. Brian Mackey, uh, owner and president and chief bottle washer of uh, BD Mackey Consulting. So uh, we'll be uh, presenting this really interesting webinar today. Uh, Brian, do you have any slides you want to show us that uh, help get things started? Kind of the usual control panel set here. If you're hearing us, you've either got, you've got your mic or telephone set properly. If you want to move the control panel out of the way so you can see the whole screen, hit the little orange and white arrow. Uh, there's the raise your hand button for some reason which we're never quite sure of. But the most important one is if you do want to ask questions, feel free to ask questions and we will um, answer them as close to in context as we can. And uh, hello to Clint in Wyoming today. So anyway, uh, we've got a little different audience than we have today and uh, have some folks from uh, a little little further out of town than we usually get, but we're really pleased to have the audience we have today. So Brian, I'm going to turn it over to you and we'll go from there. So this is basically a small little session of what I presented at Revit Technology Conference as well as Autodesk University. For the Navisworks side of things, it's something I'm really passionate about, so that's why I figured we should do this on um, Valentine's Day. <laughs> Show my passion towards Navisworks as well. And it's really the power that Navisworks bring to us in search sets. So I always say, you know, a lot of designers don't take advantage of this because most people out there think Navisworks is strictly for contractors. And even so, I see a lot of contractors not taking advantage of this. So when I sit down with contractors and start training them on, look what you can do with search sets in Navisworks, they're usually amazed. Oh, my God, we had no idea we can do this. So really going to get in and start talking about um, the difference between search sets and selection sets because that's kind of a big deal. Most people know about selection sets. Quite a few people know about search sets, but I think they're way underutilized. And then how do we create those? Well, we you know, use the find items tools to do this. Then I'll talk about how once we get some standards set up, we can go ahead and just bring those in and use them on every single project. So we'll just go ahead and dive right into this. Again, like Stan said, any point in time, if you have questions, feel free to type those questions in. I would rather get those questions answered at the beginning why it's in context and waiting all the way until the end of the presentation to remember what we were talking about at the point in time the question came up. So I've opened up Navisworks, not a big deal, and I'm going to go ahead and just choose to open up a couple MEP files, or excuse me, a couple Revit files inside of here. So I really want to come in here and just start looking at the Revit files. So I'm going to go ahead and open up um, a couple other Revit files. I'll open up uh, the structure, the MEP, as well as the architectural versions of this file I have. And just so you can see, there's nothing going on behind the scenes. This is just default Revit projects. Now, since my background is Revit and most of the architects and engineers I work with use Revit, just understand that I'm going to be showing you the Revit properties and how to do this. The same is going to be true if you bring in an AutoCAD file, if you bring in a DGN file. doesn't really matter what type of file you're bringing in. The, everything is going to be true for being able to create the search sets, dig into properties, and figure out how you want to do it. So I'm going to be looking at Revit properties, but if it was an AutoCAD file, you'd be going ahead looking at the layers for AutoCAD, et cetera, et cetera, when we start going into that. Brian, could I ask a quick question of everybody, and this is where we can use the little hand button, I guess. I'm curious um, how many folks out there are using uh, Navisworks on a regular basis already and know it fairly well. So if, if you folks can hit your hand button there and kind of raise your hand to indicate you are using it, that'd be, be great. So it looks like maybe, you know, a smaller percentage are actually using it on a regular basis than those here who aren't using it. And that's, that's good to know. Navisworks, and as we were talking before we started, Brian, Navisworks is, a, is an amazing product. I, I love this product. It's really great, but, and it's really fairly simple to use from the point of view of uh, buttons pushing type stuff, what this button does, what that button does. But when we hold Navisworks classes or when BD Mackey does classes on Navisworks, the real questions that come up are the process. So this is where we're going to start delving into some of the process issues today with what we're doing. So it's good to see how many people are using it. 
So I've opened up Navisworks now. This isn't default settings. I did say default earlier. I have went through and adjusted like things, um, the way I like to see my project units, the way my little toolbars are set. So a little bit might be different than if you just started the project. But wanted to dive into the fact that you'll notice that once I've linked in a file, like I said, I don't care, and I shouldn't say linked, once I've appended a file, it doesn't matter if you're using AutoCAD, MicroStation, even ACES Solids, all of these objects have properties associated to them. So the first thing I always like to talk about is I'm going to come in here and select an object. Again, I'm using Revit files, but it doesn't matter what type of file it is. And when I start grabbing Revit files over here in my nice little selection tree, it's going to start showing me, oh, that this is in this file. And for Revit, this is on the first floor. So in Revit, we deal with the different levels. They're still called, in Revit's interpretation of those levels, they're called layers. And underneath those layers, we have all of these types of objects. And that's really cool. We can use those properties to a point. What I also like to show is that when I come into Navis, or in Navisworks and start selecting objects, I can have, depending on the file you're using, tons more objects in my properties dialog. So I think this is one of the things that properties and not everybody opens up. It's, hey, let me grab this object, let me go through. But all of these objects have properties to them. Now, I'm going to use those properties in a little bit to start helping me automatically dive in and start seeing things that are going on. But what I'm going to start doing is I've opened up also my um, panel called my sets panel. So I've got my selection tree and my sets panel open already. When I come in here and start looking at these sets, as you can see, they're blank. But we can use sets in Timeline, or we can use sets in Clash Detection. We can simply create sets to turn things on and off that we may or may not want to see. A lot of different reasons why we can use sets. And as I start creating these sets, you're going to see that there's two different kinds, a selection and a search. So right now, I'm going to talk about a selection set. So a lot of times, you know, maybe a contractor is going to be getting in here. They're going to come through here and start grabbing different objects and be like, okay, I'm going to grab those foundations, and maybe I'm going to create what's called a selection set. And these selection sets are going to be part of Foundation 4.1. Right, then I could go through here and grab these next um, selection items and just say, okay, then maybe all of these little objects here, we'll throw these ones in as well. These are going to be part of a set called Foundation 4.2. I'm getting lazy, so I'm just going to do acronyms. And then we can come down here and grab these objects here, and these are going to be Foundation 4.3. And there's nothing wrong with doing it this way, and for the most part, contractors are still going to have to use what are called selection sets. And the problem that comes involved is the fact that, let's say the designers go in and change. Maybe they deleted this foundation out in Revit and put a new one in. Or maybe they went in and added 50 more different foundations. As that starts to happen, the unfortunate part is, is these sets aren't going to update with that. So you'll have to go back and say, oh, geez, they added a new one. And part of Foundation 4.1, maybe all these isolated foundations here got added to it. So if I come back and grab Foundation 4.1, it still remembers the original three. So if I want to add these other ones to it, now I'm going to have to hold my control key down, grab these objects, right? And we're going to say all of these are also part of Foundation 4.1. So then I have to come in here and update this um, selection set. So I go grab more things, I hit update. Now you'll see if I go back and select Foundation 4.1 and they're part of it. So as the designers keep changing what's going on in the project, I have to keep adding to, taking away from deciding what's going on. And if I'm truly a contractor in this manage, maybe someone's come back and say, oh, what are you talking about? All of these should have been 4.2, these should have been 4.3, 4.4. You can always rename these sets. That's not a big deal. So maybe I want to make this one 4.4. And now I want to come into this one and make this one 4.3. Try this again. Getting fat fingered here. And then I could come in here and say, oh, well, these are all going to be part of this new selection set foundation 4.2. Ryan, I've got a question for you real quick here, and hopefully you can kind of use it as some guidance for the folks out there, because we know that so many people who were using, you know, people are using Navisworks straight up, and then so many people were, you know, pushed into uh, Building Design Suite Premium with Autodesk, which has Navisworks Simulate, and then other people are using the building, or the uh, Navisworks uh manage program which has the full clash detection and so forth would you be kind enough because I know I recognize a lot of the names and I recognize a lot of them have building design suite premium with just the simulate in it kind of point out that pretty much everything you're doing right now is available in just the Navisworks simulate yes and that's a good point I'm glad you brought that up Stan so everything I'm going to show you today 
unless at the end we have a few minutes at the end uh, I can get into uh, Clash Detective and show you how to use these. Everything with the exception of Clash Detective you can do a Navisworks simulate. So even when I start talking to, to firms and they have you know one or two licenses of Navisworks simul or of Navisworks um, Ultimate. That's not what it's called. Navisworks, Navisworks Manage, Manage, part of the building design suite Ultimate. Right. So if you have Navisworks Manage, you don't need to open up Navisworks Manage to do this. So a lot of my clients have two man manages and 50 simulates. Everything you're do I'm doing right now to set this project up can be done in simulate. The only time I have to open up Manage is if I'm going to go in and do Clash Detective. Right. So I'm glad you brought that up, Stan. Very good point. This is all going to be done inside of simulate. Okay. Yep. So one thing that I like to point out is that's great. We've created selection sets, and there's nothing wrong with doing selection sets. What is cool is if I grab one of these objects, I can really start looking at all of the different properties we have inside of here. And for Revit World, we're going to be going to the Element tab right now. So all these different tabs have different properties. The Element tab is kind of like an uh, not all-inclusive, but a lot of an inclusive information of what's going on in all of the other things in here. So like if I look at the Element, it does show me what level it's on. A lot of times it'll show me the Element, excuse me, the Element ID. So the element ID here is the same as the element ID up there. So it just it does kind of break it down into different scenarios. But right now I'm going to go to the element tab, and I'm going to start looking at what's going on in the properties here. So I'm going to come down, and I'm going to open up my find items. Again, you might not have this open at the default when you start um, Navisworks. So one thing I always tell everybody when you are st starting Navisworks, there's very few tools open. On your view tab, you can go to the windows and start turning on and off tools you want to see. Or you could possibly go to the load workspace and just load the Navisworks extended, and that opens up the majority of the tools. Then feel free to situ situate them however you want. But if you open up Navisworks and you're like, oh my goodness, I don't see what's going on here, load the Navisworks extended, and it's going to look very similar to the way I have it here. Mine's been customized a little bit. As you can see, I have my own workspace. Okay? But I'm going to open up this Find Items tool because what I want to do is I want to grab one of these objects, and now what's going to happen is I'm going to start looking to the element properties. So inside of Navisworks, we said it says these are the properties I extracted from project from program X. So with the Revit world, I'm going to come down here and now start using this find items tool. I want to find any object on the element tab. So I'm looking in the element tab. So with the category inside the find items dialog here, the big thing on category is I'm going to choose what tab I'm on. I am on the element tab. So this first column basically matches what tab you're on. The second column, what property are you looking for, matches the property column inside of your, your properties. So I'm going to go to the property, and in this case, I'm just going to use the category. So I'm going to go to property that equals structural foundations. Oops. Write that again. And also, the options that you have in here are going to be dependent on the type of objects you've loaded. So if you load a Revit MEP file, an AutoCAD file, you're going to have tons of different types of properties inside of here for what you're looking for. So I'm on an element, and I'm looking for category. And I should have just typed the letter C, but I missed it. And then once you figure out what category you're at, what is your condition going to be? Do I want it to equal this, contain this, et cetera, et cetera? So in this case, I'm just going to say equals. And then what value are you looking for? I'm looking for the value of structural foundation. So I've just created basically a search. Not, not much different than like if you were in Google, you'd be saying search anything, you know, Revit plus, you know, foundations and issues or whatever you're doing in Google. It's just broken down into a little bit different of a dialogue. So once I get my search set up, I can come down here and say find all, and it's going to highlight everything in this file that matches that search. So even if I'm a contractor and I've got to go through and create all of these um, selection sets, a lot of times, I'll go in and create search sets first to help me find those objects. So what I'm going to do is now that I've searched this and I've got it all selected, rather than click Save Selection, I'm going to hit my little binoculars and save the search. So these are going to be my structural foundations. So now, anytime I come back to the model and I want to see all structural foundations, I can just come click on this search set and boom, there's every structural foundation in the file. I can also use this by selecting it and then going like to my home tab and say hide everything else. So now that I say hide unselected, there are just the structural foundations. Now I don't know about you guys, but going to create these little selection sets the, that I've done, not the search set, the selection sets, much easier if that's all I'm looking for. Especially this is a pretty small building. Imagine you get in this really large building and there's thousands of these things. You're trying to find them. You're trying to turn things on and off. Go create yourself a search set. Turn that sucker on and off as you need be. 
So that's what's beautiful about this as we start getting into it is we can start using the search thing. And now the nice part is now that I've already got structural foundations set up and I'm looking for element categories, that's the basis of creating Revit searches inside of Navisworks. So I'm like, oh, gee, now I want to go look for structural columns. I'll change this to be structural columns. I'll do a find all. Here's all the structural columns. I'll create a search called structural columns. Boom. Now if I want to see just structural columns in this project, I can grab structural columns and I can go on. Oops. Try that one more time. I did not mean to do that. Let's redock this down here. I wish there was an undo on the docking because now this is going to be a pain. Because I don't want this here. I wanted it in between, but that's fine for now. So if I come down here and grab structural columns, they're all selected. I'm going to go say hide unselected, and you're going to see, boom, there are just the structural columns inside of my object. So really setting these up, especially if it's coming from the Revit world, can go extremely quickly on what you're trying to do. Okay, this is going to drive me crazy. I'm going to reset the search. Now, Brian, while you're resetting that search here, um, let me ask you this. I mean, I can see that... Okay, and because you're using all Revit files, you're in you're in Revit. If this were a MicroStation file or a, let's say a Tecla file and a, a Revit architectural file and a you know Revit MEP file, whatever it may be, it doesn't matter. But people are probably wondering, okay, why should I use Navisworks to search for this? What advantage does that give me over say just looking for these elements in Revit or whatever. Well, you can find them in Revit, and that's not a big deal. But the nice part about this is if you are using Navisworks, we're going to take advantage of these search sets to either use a timeline animation to go and use these in Clash Detective. Or a lot of times that I'm working, now I'm a little bit weird. My structural files, the, the columns are always a, a red material. So mm -hmm. anything steel becomes red. Well, sometimes in Navisworks, everything's gray because engineers don't necessarily have assigned a material. Or if they have, they haven't made the material pretty. So everything's a gray. So for me, I'll go through and start using these sets to do more than just search for things, but to override the looks, override the graphics. As, you, as you've already seen, I'm using them to turn things on and off. Basically, if you're familiar with Revit, like I would with the Revit categories. So I'm using these right. to isolate categories, hide categories, and I'm looking to the default properties in Revit. Again, right. same thing would be true if I was using an AutoCAD file, but instead of using element categories, I'd be using element layers equals a wall. So my AutoCAD layer wall, or my, if you're a MicroStation user, my, Auto, my AutoCAD level, or MicroStation level would be wall, etc. And again, the reason I ask is because we have a mixed audience, and several people are using Navisworks, but then some people uh, are just have access to it now in their building design suite that they just received, and they're kind of wondering, well, what, what do I do this how do I incorporate it into my workflow? So there you go. There's some thoughts on that. So a couple different things you're going to start to see when I get inside of here. So when I start really looking in here and I grab walls and columns, etc., walls is going to be the example of where I'm really going to come in here. So I'm going to go hide unselected. So I've got all these walls selected, but a lot of times you're going to notice, especially in the, in the Revit world, who's modeling the wall? Is this an architect's wall or a structural engineer wall? What's going on? So I created another search set that was just search sets for walls. But what's also cool about this is these search sets don't necessarily have to search everything you have loaded. And this is the part where I really start to talk about creating down here in the Find Items tool. So I came in here and said element category equals walls, but I only want to look for walls in the structural model. Well, it's finding all of them because I'm familiar with this building. You guys aren't. But I know this wall right here, if I pick it, it'll show me, is in the structural Revit file. But if I pick this wall, it's in the architectural Revit file. Or maybe I want to start looking for walls that are only concrete or tons of different things we can do. Well, if I only want to find structural walls, then what I'm going to do is come down here and say, okay, let's take these walls, and as opposed to looking in all three files, let's just look to the structure file. So I'm basically going to highlight structure or unhighlight offices and the architecture and the MEP file. So now when I do a find all, boom, you're going to see it's only finding those objects. So now I only have 13 objects selected. So now I can say, okay, let's save this search and let's call them walls structural. Now I take that exact same search set, turn on the offices, do a find next, oops, a find all, save this search, and now I've got one for walls architectural. So you can see very quickly I can get this set up depending on what the file is. So now there's my architectural walls, there's my structural walls, they're all walls together. So 
So theoretically, I have 195 objects together, and the sum of the, the two should be 195, which they are. So that's a good thing. Brian, if, you, if you're working in, say, an office, and you want to do these types of searches, what you have here now or whatever, as kind of a template, can you do that as kind of a, set this up as kind of a standardized template so those search sets carry over into whatever someone wants, whatever project someone wants to look at? Yeah, and that's the big thing. So I've got Revit open just to kind of show you guys. So this is the project I'm working on, and this is a project. It was created a few years ago, but it has almost everything modeled in it. Not everything, or at least something of every Revit category. So it's got electrical equipment, it's got um, mechanical equipment, it's got all of this different stuff inside of there. So I brought this into Navisworks. Basically, you've seen what I've just been doing in Navisworks. So when I'm inside of Navisworks, I have all of those different objects for me to look through in here. So if I start looking, you'll see in the architectural file, I had casework and ceilings and columns and stairs and handrails. And in the structural file, I had X, Y, and Z. So I simply brought this file in and started using it to see all of those different properties that are there. Because you can try to create them, but you don't know if they're actually being successful if you don't have anything to select. So then what I did is realize what categories I was missing in Revit. So inside of Revit, I then created an additional file where I started modeling things I did not have. So since I originally created that file, cable trays came out. So I modeled a few cable trays in here. I modeled some data devices or nurse call stations. I modeled some other things that weren't in that model, appended this file to the, uh, the same Navisworks file, and now that I was inside of Navisworks, I could then do a search and find things. Oops. See, see if this answers your question, Gene. If it doesn't, we'll, we'll elaborate a little bit further, but I, I think we're going down um, that path. We'll, we'll get there, Gene, in just one second. This is the beauty, that question. So Gene had a question of how easy is it to update search sets. You don't need to, and that's the beauty of these. And I'm going to show you what I mean on that in just one second. It's partially why I have the Revit file open. Yep. So when I come in here and start doing this, I don't want to have to do this on every single project. So what I have is this beautiful button right here, and I'm actually going to just delete these ones out of here because I think they match the names of my other ones. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to come in here, and I'm going to go import a search set. That's all I'm going to do. And I've got this one called Revit Categories. If you've got clients using like AutoCAD MEP, more than likely they're going to use consistent layers. You can have AutoCAD MEP layers. You could have Revit MEP layers. This is every Revit category, but you could break it down. If you're a contractor working with you know, architects consistently and they always use, and they're on AutoCAD and they have it called A-Wall, create one called you know, Architect XYZ's layers or whatever you want to do. Because once you set this up in one project, save it to your server. And I'll show you how to do that in a second. Then all I have to do is say open. Takes me about three seconds to do this and check this out. Here's every single Revit category. Here's furniture systems. Here's just regular furniture. Here's all the lighting devices. Here's my pipe accessories. I just instantly imported that, and within seconds, I now have all of these inside of here. I can now use them for Navisworks clash detections. I can use them for Navisworks timelining. I can just simply start overriding colors on these things if I want to. So it's one of those beautiful tools that starts happening inside of here. And as you can see, if I come in here and I'm just looking at walls, right? So right now on walls, we have 195 objects selected. The thing that I love about these is, so let's say, great, somebody came in here and they decided that, wow, we need some walls floating off in space. Terrible example, but you guys will get what I'm going for here. So I'm just going to come over here and model some great walls. Now, just to point out, Brian has jumped over into Revit at this yep. point. Sorry, I'm in Revit, updating the file. I'm going to save my Revit file here, right? So not a big deal. I drew those three walls. And now back in Navisworks, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in here and say I want to refresh. And what the refresh does is it goes and looks to any file that's updated and updates it inside of here. It's similar to like if you had xref into AutoCAD, you're updating xref or in Revit if you've linked something inside of Revit, uh, reloading the link. And that's where we play our zones, right? This has been updated. I haven't done anything in Navisworks except for either reopen it or refresh the file. And now when I come down here and select my walls, those are automatically added to the search set because their properties match what's going on. Every time you click a selection set, Revit, or not, excuse me, Revit, Navisworks is re researching. So you set the criteria up. Every time you click on it, it researches. So as you can see, Gene, I did nothing inside of Navisworks to do this. Somebody just simply added objects inside of Revit. 
So that's all that has to happen. If somebody adds it inside of there, boom, you get these search sets created. Now let me ask you because we're, you know, it's so easy for us to talk about Revit, and I see a lot of the audience is Revit users. But let's say it is AutoCAD file or a Tecla file or a, a MicroStation file or something. If these things happen, I'm going to assume that Revit's going to do the same thing with those types of files as well. It's going to spot the new stuff and. So you can tell Stan's like me, we talk about Revit more in Navisworks, but yes, you're correct, Navisworks will do the same thing yeah. depending on yeah. no matter which file you're bringing in. So even if it's a 3DS Max file and somebody changes in it, as long as that object has properties you can select, it will update to those properties. Right. So works really, really well when you're setting it up. Obviously, garbage in, garbage out, depends on how nice it's going to be set up from the client who's dealing with it. So what I also like to show is I showed you how to create walls just for structural. I showed you how to create walls just for architectural. But what if I'm looking for walls that are concrete? Well, I can come down here, and you'll see that I've switched over. I've selected an object, and I've switched over to, instead of the element tab, I'm switching over to the Revit material tab. Again, I'm showing you Revit stuff. It would be similar for other programs. But with this Revit material, I can see that there's a Revit whose property's name it has the word concrete in it. So rather than being on the element tab, I'm going to go browse to the Revit material tab. And I'm going to go to the property whose name, I'm just going to say contains concrete. Now right now, I purposely left this a lowercase c, and this is an uppercase c. So theoretically, if I do a find all, there's nothing happening. Because I did want to point out that in Navisworks, there's this little match case button. So if I hit the match case, you get the little, I don't know, I'm sorry, it looks like a yellow marijuana leaf to me. <laughs> but you get this little yellow icon saying, I am not case sensitive. So now when I come up here and do find all, it's finding everything. So if I look in here, there's 94 objects. It's finding floors, footings, foundations, etc. Well, I'm only looking for concrete walls. And then I'm going to look for concrete foundations. Of course, I would imagine all foundations are concrete. but So I'm only looking for concrete walls, maybe concrete stairs if we had any of those. So I'm not going to look in every single model for this. What's beautiful about search sets is once you start creating them, you can do a sub-search of a search. So I want to go look in walls. I don't want to look for everything, right? We've got 94 objects that are made of concrete. I only want to find concrete walls. So now I do a find all, and there's only 17 of those. So I've narrowed this search from 95 elements having concrete, which was probably partially the composite metal deck, to just concrete walls. Again, once that's done, save my search. Now I can come in and say these are going to be walls on concrete. Right? And if I really start going through and doing this, I can then again save this out. Now, if my next architect or engineer doesn't call that material concrete and they call it CONC, this is not going to work if I import it to another project. Right. So some of these things may work, may not work, may not be set up the way you want, but you can really start not only using searches for this, you have all of the tabs and the find items. Now, actually, I didn't even have to do that. If I come back up here and just grab the walls category, rather than searching in all of the files, I can go to this properties category and start searching in the properties. I'm going to pull this up a little bit. So in the properties of all of the files for Revit, I can come down here and say, oh, gee, what property are we looking for? Well, I'm going to go look for, find the R's, the Revit material. So I'm looking for walls and the Revit materials whose name equals concrete. And this is the only difference is if you're doing it through the properties, you can't use the contains, does not contains, is greater than those type scenarios. But I could say go search for all of these. So if I do the same find all here, I should find the same 13 items I had before. So you can go into properties of things and search the sub. You can do searches in properties. You can do searches in entire files. You can do searches under sub searches or sub searches under searches. So really taking advantage of all of this stuff to, to get this information for what you wanted to, to do and use it for. Now, Brian, uh, is there any sort of wild card system? So like the concrete, if you put C-O-N-C or something and then wild card, is, is there anything like that that would help you? Um, that's um, basically what the condition searches? is for. Your wild card okay. is the condition. So you do have wild card here, so then you can insert oh, wild okay. card. But you, usually it's just going to be contains, is defined, is not defined, etc. cetera. Yep. So that's kind of your wild card. I haven't really had much success using the wild card. Maybe there's people out there who have, and they'll, they'll correct me here if I'm wrong. But I just usually do contains, doesn't contain. But there is another thing in here that starts to happen. So like you'll see if I come over here to Revit, 
Revit categories, there's Revit ductwork. In this case, I'm actually just going to go back here real quick and turn off the structure in the architecture file just because that way we'll get a better um, understanding of what we're doing here. Let me try that again. Dang it. Right click, I'll just go hide those. So just looking at the MEP, when I start coming here looking at this MEP file, there are duct. But then there's also duct accessories and duct fittings and flex duct and all these different types of duct work. If you're, if you're an MEP person, you probably understand that. What's great about this is I've created one that also just says duct contains. So kind of the same theory, if we look at the one that says duct accessories, it's an element category that equals duct accessories. So if I really want to break it down to duct accessories, to diffusers, to whatever I want to do, I can really start breaking that down, or kind of in a wild card scenario, I'm saying if it contains the word duct. Now, the other thing that you can do is maybe I have this search set, set up here looking at what's going on, but I also want not only ducts, but air terminals, because in my mind this is part of MEP side of things. I'm looking for more all mechanical stuff. So you'll see that down here I can add an additional category. So again, I'm just going to basically say the element whose category, type in the letter C so I'm not searching all over the place. So whose category contains, um, we'll just say air. So now I'm going to do a find all, wait, hold on a second, no objects are selected. Well, maybe I have an uppercase issue, find all. Still nothing being selected. Because by default, when you have more than a single line, this is an and situation. So I'm looking for something whose category contains duct and a category that contains air. Well, in Revit, you can't do that. But if I right click on this, I can change it from a, an and condition to an or condition or a negate condition. So it contains duct and not air, or contains duct, contains duct or air. So I can actually change this out. So now when I say find all, I've got 11, or 1,161 objects as opposed to when I was just looking at the duct. I only had like 1,100 objects. So I've got 60 diffusers. So you can really start breaking these search sets down into the different properties, adding conditions to it, more than one thing, doing your kind of wild card by contains or equals, a lot of different settings you can start doing when you get set up inside of there. And, and I hope I get this name correct here. I, I believe it's Kaj um, asks, can you do a search set and retrieve, say, sheet metal to tally a total of, um, you know, that you can translate to tons, and then another where you change color, say, in a field survey of installed items, and then have the ability to track percent installed by compared by comparing the two uh, without using a third party tool. In this release of Rev, or excuse me, Navisworks, no, we can't. So the big thing on this when you're going through and set up is Navisworks is just basically this release of Navisworks is just basically coming in and saying, okay, here's the tools we have. We're just finding items. There's no quantifications or anything we can do there. I mean, if you really wanted to, because you can see when I grab the properties, it pretty much goes blank if you grab more than one object. But I can use it to help start changing colors, absolutely. And this is kind of one of the big things that I start telling people that I like to do inside of here. So a lot of it for me is I might have like a duct contains, but I'll then do a sub search of ducts and say, okay, I want to find a duct, and I'm just going to come grab a duct up here. And I think in Revit it's under element, who's supply air? So I'll go to Revit and say what the system type contains the word supply. So a lot of times what I'll do is an element and as opposed to category, I'm going to go into system type. Tap give me a second here to find it. Unfortunately, you can key to the first character, but you can't key to the second character. So system type contains, uh, actually I think there's a system type, so I shouldn't say element, I should say system type here. And we'll go to the T Try that again. We'll go to the T so I can go up one. <laughs> That's me being lazy. System type, um, who's, I'm on the wrong tab. I'm sure it's going to be name, contains, supply. I'll delete this condition, and I'll do a click back up here. Oh. I just want to say contains supply. You'll find all. So there's all the supply error. But again, it's looking through everything, and I'm okay because system types don't belong in architecture. But more importantly, I would probably, because it could actually be, you could possibly, 
depending on what's happening, maybe they're using duct work for other things. So I'm not going to search everything. Again, I'm going to go do a search underneath my duct contains category. So we'll grab duct contains. I'll save this search, and I'm just going to call it supply. Call it duct supply. Okay, and the reason I started to do this is now that you're getting these search sets set up, and notice I'm in the sets panel. Okay, there is a difference because the selection tree also has a sets tab. And this is where it gets really weird because if I want to start changing the colors of things, I can't do it down here in the sets panel. I have to do it in the sets tab of the selection tree. So now that this is set up inside of here, I'm going to go to my sets tab. I'm going to grab duct supply and I can right click. And I can say, hey, you know what, I want to override the, the color, and I want all supply duct to be green. So now you can see, oh, there's all my supply duct inside of here. I'm going to grab this and just type in the word return. Do a find all. I'll save this search. Save search. And we'll call this duct return. And now I have it up here to go say return duct is going to be, I will make that some sort of pinkish color. So now you can see just once these sets are set up, I can really have it start going through and doing what I wanted to do. So if you were starting to do things inside of here with just the searches and you started saying, oh, we've got this set, which is going to be port one, port two, port three, and you start color coding those to graphically see these on the screen, that's how we would go through and set up. It's going to be manual adjustment. Now, there is a way through Timeliner to say once it's been installed, change colors through Timeline Animation. You could do that as well. Unfortunately, we're not going to have time to get into that today. But uh, hopefully that kind of gets you a little ways down the road, Kaj, because you can, you can use this and then you can use the Timeline <coughs> to kind of show what has been and should be installed and then what has been installed. And maybe that will get you a little ways down there. And I do want to bring one other thing up that there's another way to kind of do this, and it's called the Selection Inspector. So the Selection Inspector will actually allow you to come in, and I'm not going to get into this too much, but to kind of on the same page, allow you to choose, start quickly choosing definitions of things. So if it equals this, 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 and this, then once you find that, you can say, oh, automatically go through and change the color, etc. And again, similar to search sets, you can then import and export those. I don't use this a ton simply because I have to set this up and then I can only use them in the selection inspector. My personal thing of choice is to do a lot of that with search sets because then A, I can transfer that from project to project, but I can use those search sets, like I said, in Timeliner, Animator, um, in other situations to do what I wanted to do. So yes, there are multiple ways to do this, but kind of one of those things, this is really how I go through and start setting this up. So it's kind of one of those beautiful tools as you start seeing these search sets can start doing other things, everything. And it's funny, a lot of times people ask me, like, man, inside of Revit, I'm looking for certain things that do this or other things that do that. And sometimes you can find it in Revit, but to switch to views and get to it all, it's, it's a pain and it's cumbersome and it can take time. A lot of times I'll just open it up in Navisworks, do some searches for the properties I'm looking for out of the Revit model, and boom, here we go, I can see what's going on. I know one of the questions that comes up to me quite often is, oh, I'm using phase one, phase two, phase three in Revit. How do I know exactly what's on every phase? Well, as long as it's a 3D object, I can go through and do that really quickly inside of Navisworks, say search for any object whose phase contains whatever. So if we go grab an object again, and I believe there's phasing in here. So what phase was it created? New construction. So I can go say, find everything that was created in new construction, created in phase one, phase two, phase three, however you have your project set up, search for that, and then start pulling this into Navisworks just in a simple phasing. I've done that inside of Navisworks before, then added it to my timeline animation to search for these objects, added it as a timeliner, and then kind of showed the building going up in phasing. So I said, find structural columns who equal phase one, find structural foundations, columns, beams, walls, doors, windows, and I kind of did all this as a separate search set, went to my timeliner, associated those to it, boom, within 15, 20 minutes, I did a simulation for my project using the default properties out of the Revit program I was using. So just different tools, being able to use those search sets, start getting them set up how you want to do it. And as you can see, I really like this because if I go back and turn everything on again, what's great about setting the sets up and changing things 
inside of that model is now, and I'll just go ahead and I'll snap the button I wanted. Dang it, I hate it when I do that. Um, if I just kind of come in here and start walking through my model now, let's grab my little feet print, let's go into the building, let's go down. And this is a this is a where the, you start to diverge a little bit between Navisworks Simulate and Navisworks Manage. You can do these walkthroughs in both, but you know, in, in Simulate, what you're going to be able to do is do walkthroughs and kind of, if you will, visual clash detection. You can kind of look around and see if things are bumping into each other, but you won't have that automated clash detection. So just so you're aware of the differences. So you can start to see just by turning the supply and the return error on. Again, I probably would have added a different one where I added um, yeah, error terminals. But as I start coming through here and looking at this, actually those are diffusers, but anyways, yes. I can start to see what's the supply, what's the um, return. I can start to see everything inside of here. And then I can then kind of start looking like, okay, obviously that's a clash. But more importantly, um, really? I'm not an MEP engineer, but I can't imagine that I have a supply connecting in with the return. Gene, do you do that very often? So just throwing it out there, it may not be me, uh, but it's one of those things where this isn't going to be a clash doing any of this stuff. None of this is going to be there, but having these colors, using those search sets, looking at the properties, nobody's going to probably notice this. Is this a big deal? Maybe not, but hey, we could be using volume computations, and you know, in this case, I actually don't think it's tying off of it. I think that's actually a clash. <laughs> so I seriously think this is not connected. This is a clash going through, and I could tell by if I select this. So yeah, this is obviously a clash, so that's kind of an issue. The light going through the ductwork, yeah, that's obviously an issue. But just the point here is to be able to use all of these nice colors to help us start determining, wow, what's going on inside of here? How is this file going in? What are we looking at all of those? Maybe we know that the return error or the supply error, man, maybe that's not a great location. Can we move that? Because if it's just a return error, can we move it somewhere else that's visually more appealing or whatever else we're talking about going in? <laughs> yeah, Elvis, it won't. that's funny. Uh, Elvis says it, uh, Revit won't let you connect uh, a pink deck to a green deck. <laughs> but it will let you connect pink to purple. Or in this case, since it's Valentine's Day, pink and red would definitely yeah. connect. Anyway, uh, Gene does ask, though, um, how about using search sets in Clash Detective? Well, and that's the beautiful tool. is, And this is why I actually have this set up. And I'm going to do a little bit of this um, in Clash Detective and Timeline. I'm going to show you some other uses of this stuff. But this is the beauty of it. So I can actually go in and have these search sets created. And now, jumping into Navisworks Manage, so I close my simulate and open up Manage, I can go into my Clash Detective, which somehow I lost. That really stinks. When did I do that? So I'm going to come in here, go to my Clash Detective, possibly if I can find it. There it is. So now inside of my Clash Detective, what's great about this is rather than searching the architectural model to the MEP model, getting a bazillion clashes, I can start setting up a test. And in this test now, rather than looking at the model, I'm going to go look at my sets. So I really want to start doing one between uh, ducts, and I'll do my duct contains. And then over here, I want to start doing it to structural framing. So all I'm doing is setting those searches up. I set them up once, I import, and that literally takes me about five seconds. Okay, maybe 30 seconds if I have a slow connection to the network. I do these two. I can set up, you know, is it a clearance? Is it a hard class? We'll make it a clearance of five. We'll run the test. I've now used those ducts to it, and here are all my classes of ducts going into structural framing. So one of those really nice tools that I can start using those selection sets. And it's funny because this is why we say where we can start using Navisworks for um, even designers. A lot of my architects look at me like I'm crazy, but one of the things I'll start doing is saying, you know, let's go ahead and do one on stairs and handrails, and those are just called railings, and let's run those to doors, right? Not really going to do this in the real world, and uh, yeah, let's do them to doors and ceilings, and we'll make this a hard clash. I don't need a clearance clash, and I'll say run test, and in this case, I don't have any issues. You'd be amazed at how when I go to architect's offices and I run this clash, there's like 30 or 40. It's like, oh, whoops, we put a ceiling in the stairwell, so now our stair is going through the ceiling we got our handrail running into the doorway, so now we've got a clash there. So I start using these search sets to check my design to make sure that I'm not 
looking stupid to my consultants or to the owner. If you walk in through a presentation and seeing a pink duck running into a green duck, that would upset me. But if I'm in Navisworks trying to do that test, well, gee, how do we do a supply versus return duck? Well, I'm going to do duck supply. Oops, come down here to set and do duck return. And again, what we're doing right now is in the Navisworks manage portion. Of it. Yep. Hmm. It says none on that one. Duck supply versus duck run. I wonder, because I've done this before, not on this project. Let me go back to my select. I don't think I should be doing self-intersect on that, but let's try. Hmm. That's definitely a collision, so I don't know what I'm missing. Oh, I know what I'm missing. I didn't do... No? It's all there. Surfaces. Let's try this again. Wow. I should be having those clashes hit. I don't know what's going on with this one. I'll have to go back and see if I can play with this one and figure out. It's how you know it's live when there's always issues. It's not pre-recorded videos here. Although this will be recorded, and then it'll be corrected on the recording, I guess. Huh? No, it won't be corrected on the recording. I just mean I didn't do pre-recorded videos and just hit the play button. Yeah. So I should be having classes on that one. I don't know why I'm not. I'll have to go through and see what's going on with that uh, situation there. Let's do a clearance of one inch and just see what happens. Hmm. So it's finding this clash, but not the other one. So I'll have to go back and see what's going on. But that's one of those tools where I start going through, and I st really start saying, I don't, you know, I'm going to do a duct hanger to, to ducts or pipe hangers to pipe if I've modeled those. Because I don't really care about everything. I want to start breaking it down. And the reason I start to do this is if you just run a clash between MEP and structure, you're going to have 6,000 clashes. That gets overwhelming. But if I can break it down via these search sets and then use these search sets to create um, Navisworks clash tests, once those are done, now I can start narrowing it down. Rather than having, you know, 6,000 clashes, it's much easier in my mind to come through and start saying, oh, I've got 60 clashes of 100. To me, it seems more reasonable than one clash of 6,000. Or 100 clashes of 60. I don't know. To me, it just seems less crazy when I start going through and setting that information out. So I started to do that now. One of the next ones we'll get into, we start talking a little bit more about Clash, and I'm not sure where the next webcast is, is these can also be imported and exported as well. And the nice part is, is you can go pre-set up a whole bunch of Clashes, export those. Next project, you don't even have to import the search sets, because if you import a Clash that's using a search set, the search set comes with it. So I'll then talk about in one presentation, I don't think it's for like three or four or five months, I'll do Navisworks Clash Detective, and I'll talk about how we can import Clash settings that will go through and automatically come through and boom. All I do is import Clash settings. It brings in all my search sets. I can then override search sets if I want to. I'm literally within 15 seconds doing Clashes on any Revit-related project. Literally in 15 seconds. It's, it's a nice tool. Maybe a minute if your computer's got to think on a large project. But set up time for me, it's nothing. And that's how I've really started setting a lot of my clients up. So hey, use these search sets. Use them in with Clashes. Go through and start seeing what's happening there. So the last thing I do want to get into is Timeliner, and this is going to be a terrible example. Let me get back to Class Detective. And again, Timeliner is, uh, just so everybody's familiar again, Timeliner is a part of the uh, both the Navisworks Simulate and Navisworks Manage products. So those of you who have the Building Design Suite Premium or recently were given it by Autodesk, um, you do have the Simulate package. Given it, that, that's a nice... That's uh, trying to be gentle here. Wow. So what I'm going to do, if you're not familiar with Timeliner, I don't think we have one scheduled for this. I'm just going to really quickly brief go over this. With what you would do is you would add a task. And if you're a contractor, you're very familiar with this. And you would have a task. You'd give it a name. So maybe this is going to be uh, my foundation pour one. And then you would give that task a date. So when is it going to start? That looks great. When is it going to end? We're going to do this in a day because we're super fast. Um, concrete pours. You're going to have this all set up in a day. You get this time set up, but then at the end, you have to then start assigning objects to this. So in this attached, what do you want to attach to it? So we have to come in here and start choosing. I've got to figure out which button it is. I always forget which button it is here. Oh, it's a big button that says attach. So you start attaching things to it. And a lot of people will actually start using searches. So we can attach current searches. We can attach current selections. We can also go through and um, attach sets. 
So hey, I want to attach a set. That's weird. You've got to do right click to get attached set. Unless there's an I thought there was an attached set button, but I could be wrong. Yeah, so anyways, I usually right click. So right click, attach a set. I'm going to go look for foundation 4.1. And then I come down here, create a new date, say when it's going to start, etc. It's a weekend. I'm not going to work a weekend because I'm super fast. I don't need to do the 19th. And then I'd right click, attach a set, foundation board to, etc., etc., etc. So I can start through here, come in the timeline. You can use the Gantt chart, etc. But what's really cool is you can do a couple things inside of here. But what I'm just going to do simply is I'm going to auto add a task for every search set we have or selection set. So boom, that's all there. They're all attached. It gives me one day timeline for all of these in these scenarios. And it also does it the way they are um, in your file. I thought so. Yeah, I'm scrolled down. So it's going to do foundation four. So it, however these are categorized in your sets. So you can rearrange these if you wanted them to be different. I'm going to get doors before walls and it's going to be a terrible timeline. But once this is done, we can grab the simulate tab, go ahead and hit play. And like I said, in a terrible fashion, we're going to start putting diffusers in before anything else with our magic floating diffusers. But we can really start using this to set this up, those search sets, to come in and create a timeline for us inside of here. What's also cool about the timeliner is you can actually link it to an Excel file. So what I have built into it as well is I've got an Excel file that has all of these tasks named out. The names match exactly, structural foundation, duct-supply or wall-concrete, wherever I've named it, just duct-space-supply. And inside of that Navisworks file, that Excel file, I come into my tasks and I actually create these from a data source. And since the names match, I set up a rule to automatically assign a search set to that data source. So inside of Microsoft Excel, I can just go through and change the dates, re-update the data source, and I can animate it that way. So rather than getting diffusers before anything else, I can truly get it put in the correct order. So using an Excel file, using the Revit, the search sets I've created from Revit, boom, I can import my Clash Detective. I can go into my timeline or import my Excel file, automatically link it. With literally in 15 minutes, I can have this file set to be animated per the dates in my Excel file, spend some time on that obviously, and then also be able to do search sets and Clash Detectives all within 15 to 20 minutes. And other things you can do with this, um, you know, Brian's talking about the Excel file, but, you know, if you're, and most of the names on the webinar today probably wouldn't apply to, but you may want to tie it into uh, Primavera P6, um, Microsoft Project, something like that. You can do that as well if you want. Yep, um, but for us laymans who don't have Microsoft Project or right. Primavera or any of those, just do a simple Excel file, save yep. it as a CSV. I actually, for me, as a designer, not as a contractor, when I have a designer hat on, I basically have that Excel spread file, which just has, hey, make everything last a week. So each one of my tasks lasts a week, because I don't really care about the time. I care about showing an animation to a client. So in there, I basically put the first date in, and everything has a plus seven, so the dates fill themselves out automatically. So I'm like, hey, this is going to start here. Boom. I can go to the last one and change the date. I can change the plus seven to be plus three or whatever to to streamline this process. And then, like I said, within 30 minutes, I can actually give it an animated sequence of how this is being built to a client for a presentation. Is it a 3DS Max animation that's all pretty? No, but this took me 30 minutes. You go do that in 30 minutes inside of 3DS Max. If you do that, I will hire you. Well, I tell you what, it's pretty darn impressive to see that timeliner run a lot of times too. So, And then the beauty part of this when it's happening is since their search sets, and this is the key, as the model changes, I reopen up Revit, or excuse me, I reopen up Navisworks when I get new models in, it's all done, it's set, it's ready to go. I rerun the clashes if I need to, I re-hit play on my animation if anything's changed, things have updated, it all does what it needs to do. So obviously this is just touching the base of it. You can create more search sets on an as project by project basis. Hey, this project, we've introduced this new property, let's go ahead and use that new property, etc. But really by setting this stuff up, I can do this extremely quickly, especially if you're just talking a schematic design type animation that you need for a presentation. And uh, just so you know, um, we're kind of coming to the end of the webinar today, but we are going to offer a few more. Brian's going to offer a few more webinars on Navisworks and so forth over the course of the year here. And 
then Brian and others from the CAD1 staff uh, are going to start talking about some of the other tools that are available in the Building Design Suite Premium and Ultimate so that those of you out there who have uh, been uh, given these products will will know kind of what they're used for and hopefully they'll be productive tools or some of them will be productive tools for you. So let's see, Brian, do we have anything else? If uh, Why don't you show your blog real quick? There it is. And uh, Brian runs, uh, in addition to his consulting services, runs uh, this great blog out there and a lot of, a lot of good Revit tips and other uh, Navisworks tips and so forth. So look for that. And, oh, I know what I was going to say. Um, the webinar today will be on the CAD1 uh, YouTube page in the next few days. I'm not sure exactly when it will get posted, but in the next few days. And if you want to find that, uh, you can go to CAD1.com and look at the webinar's uh, archives page, and you will see uh, where you can find that or a lot of our other webinars. Brian, are you, uh, and I always ask you this and I always forget, are you posting these to your page as well? I'm not as of yet. I still haven't had the chance to sit down and create a YouTube site and get all of those recorded. There's a lot of stuff I need to do, so that will probably happen this year, but I have not done it yet. So, and if any of you guys went to Revit, uh, the Revit Technology Conference, was it last year? The year before. One of the Revit Technology Conferences, this was my presentation. I got a little bit more in-depth. It was more hands-on. Here you go. You should go. Be, you should be able to go download the content if you went there. It is password protected for Revit Technology Conference participants only. I don't believe I've given this one at Autodesk University, so I don't believe it's there. If you really, really want to get the handout, uh, if you're nice enough, email me, and I'll talk to the RTC people. I can probably send that to you. So go to my website, you know, grab the contact me, and if you really want the handouts on talking about the search sets, just let me know. So very, very good. Thank you very much. I uh, hope you enjoyed the webinar today. Hope it was helpful. And look for another webinar. I believe it's on February 14th will be the next. Be March 14th. I'm excuse me, March 14th. Today is February 14th. And that one's actually going to get into Revit structure um, reinforcing. Very good. Brian, thanks for your time today. Thanks, everyone.